Hey everybody, Ryan here, and welcome back to our Operative Dentistry series. This video we will talk all about the cavity preparation, how to classify them, how to name the different components of them, and finally we'll go through from start to finish how to do a cavity preparation. So green vardaman black, better known as GV black, is one of the founders of modern dentistry in the US. And he established a lot of the concepts that we'll discuss throughout this video, one of those being the classification system for cavity preparations, very commonly tested on board exams. So let's start with a class one decay, which involves the pits and fissures. This is going to be your occlusal surfaces of the premolars and molars, also the buccal or lingual pits of molars, and the lingual pits of upper incisors. Now, if we're shifting to class 2 decay, as soon as your occlusal surface of a premolar or molar involves at least one proximal surface, it becomes a class 2 restoration. So this involves a mesio-occlusal or MO, a disto-occlusal or DO, or even an MOD, which involves both the mesial and distal proximal contact areas of those posterior teeth. Class three decay is diagnosed in the proximal surfaces of your incisors and canines. So class two is proximal of posterior, class three is proximal of anterior. But one other important distinction to make between this type and the next one is that class three does not involve the incisal edge. So class four decay is also the proximal surface of the anterior teeth, but this time, it does involve the incisal angle. So a class four lesion is basically a larger version of class three that this time covers the incisal angle. Class five decay refers to caries in the cervical third of the facial or lingual surface of any tooth right along the gum line. So this is a common place to get caries for people with exposed root surfaces, xerostomia, or in, adult, uh, in adolescents or young adults with particularly poor oral hygiene. And finally, class six decay is probably the rarest one up here, and it refers to decay on the incisal edge of anterior teeth alone, or a cusp tip or multiple cusp tips of a posterior tooth. So this type of unique decay is often caused first by some kind of abrasion or erosion, and then those defects expose underlying vulnerable dentin that is then cavitated. So let's get into specifics of the cavity preparation. So here we are staring at the mesial surface of this lower premolar. And the cemento enamel junction is down here. The crown of the tooth is up here. So this is a class two cavity because it involves at least one proximal surface of a posterior tooth. And we'll start by defining what's called the cavo surface margin. So this is a really important concept to understand, and it's where the cavity preparation meets the original tooth surface. Hence the name cavo for cavity and then surface for the tooth surface. So let's, let me show you what that looks like in this image. If we trace this around here, this is where the original untouched tooth surface meets the cavity preparation that the dentist has done. So that is the entire outline of the cavity preparation. That is the entirety of the cavo surface margin in this case. If you understand that, you're in great shape already for the rest of the concepts we'll discuss. So now we can talk about the preparation walls. Let's start with the external or outer walls. These are distinct walls of your cavity preparation that contact the cavo surface margin. So in other words, they are the walls that share an edge with the cavo surface margin. These walls are named for the outer tooth surface or aspect that they are both parallel to and closest to. 
So remember, we're staring at the mesial surface of this tooth, and this side to the left is the facial surface of the tooth. So this external wall here is going to be our facial wall because it is parallel and closest to the facial surface of the tooth. Likewise, if I change colors here, if we're looking at the lingual surface of the tooth here, the wall opposite of the one we just talked about is parallel and closest to the lingual wall. So this orange one is going to be our lingual wall of the cavity preparation. The wall farthest away from us is Par runs parallel and is closest to the distal surface of the tooth, which is what we cannot see in this image up here. So that's going to be our distal wall. And we don't have a mesial wall because that part of the tooth was removed as part of the cavity preparation. We do have another outer wall we have to talk about, though. And this one down here is a little bit funky because we don't have a gingival surface of a tooth. But if you imagine this tooth crown being a six-sided cube, that the imaginary bottom surface of that cube would be called the quote-unquote gingival surface. And so this floor of a class two cavity preparation is called the gingival wall, or more commonly, the gingival floor, because it runs parallel to the floor. Now let's move to the internal walls, which are nice and easy because there are only ever two, one or two names that you need to know for these. So this one that we've been staring at the entire time right here is called the axial wall. And that's because it runs parallel to the long axis of the tooth. And finally, we have the, I'm running out of colors, or finally, we have the pulpal wall, or more commonly, the pulpal floor, because it lays flat along the base of the prep and runs just above the pulp chamber. In a class one restoration, you won't have this cut out proximal box area, and so the only internal wall you would have in a class one preparation is the pulpal floor. So hopefully all of that makes some sense. All right, so some more essential definitions here. The junction formed between two walls of a cavity preparation. If we're looking at this area here, the junction between, in this case, the pulpal floor and the axial wall, this area right here is called the line angle. So Anywhere where two walls meet, it could be here two walls are meeting, along here two walls are meeting, Any you could pick any point, though, those are all called line angles. Now if we have a junction of three walls coming together, that point where three walls join together, like here for example, this little point is called a point angle. So that's our line angle and our point angle. So really important terms to know. Specifically what they're called, it depends on the walls that are intersecting there. So this line angle I drew here is the intersection of the axial wall and the pulpal floor. So that's called the axiopulpal line angle. This one down here is called the axiolinguo gingival point angle. So you just combine all of the involved walls. This is a quick diagram of a class three preparation. You can appreciate how all of the names of these walls sound familiar and they follow the same concepts that we just discussed. Next, we're going to talk about GV Black's preparation steps that are frequently, frequently tested on the board exam. And we'll start with the four steps of the initial tooth preparation. So the outline form defined by GV Black describes the external outline 
of the tooth surface to be included in the preparation along the cavo surface margin. So this is where the cavo surface margin really shines. This external perimeter is defined by the extent of the carious lesion. So you extend mesial, distal, facial, and lingual as needed in order to remove the caries. This idea of extension for prevention is where you, I don't have it listed here, but extension for prevention, if you ever have heard that or read that anywhere, that refers to the concept where you remove adjacent defective pits and fissures in addition to caries, where caries could recur at faulty margins if you were to leave those defective pits and fissures untouched. Importantly though, in this step of the outline form, you must restrict the initial depth to just inside the DEJ, the dentin enamel junction. That's 0.2 to 0.5 millimeters inside the DEJ. That should be your initial depth, whether or not there are still caries that go deeper. So the outline, the outline form, you're working on the width and the length of the prep to remove all caries, mesial, distal, facial, and lingual, but not the depth at this point. So there, there may very likely be caries that go deeper into the tooth that we're not concerned with at this initial stage. Now by that token, you should extend the gingival floor in class two preps to, in order to get 0.5 millimeters of clearance. That means space that you can see between this and the adjacent tooth. So this area down here is what we would call a gingival clearance between this tooth and the adjacent tooth. So it's a good rule of thumb to get at least half a millimeter of clearance to help with your restoration process. You can also extend the facial and lingual proximal walls to get 0.5 millimeters of clearance that way. So that's talking specifically breaking these contacts contacts between that part of the prep and the adjacent tooth. Gingival clearance was talking about this space down here specifically. So it's also a good idea to get that kind of clearance facially and lingually unless it would require unreasonable removal of sound tooth structure in order to break that contact. Because we don't want to just get rid of a bunch of healthy tooth structure if it's going way out of the way from where the caries is. But why do we usually want to break the proximal contacts in class two preps, you might be asking? Well, it gives us adequate access for the preparation. We have less potential to nick the adjacent tooth. It allows for easier placement of the matrix band and easier condensation and carving of amalgam if that's the restorative material we're using. All right, so that's about everything that you could be tested on for the outline form. I talked about uh, having healthy enamel. This is examples of unhealthy enamel. And during the outline form, all weakened and unsupported enamel should be removed. So friable enamel refers to demineralized enamel that needs to be removed because the bonding agent is not as effective when used on it. Unsupported enamel is undermined which also needs to be removed because there's no underlying healthy dentin to support it. So essentially it's been the dentin that has been supporting this enamel has been compromised. So this enamel is going to be kind of hanging out with no underlying healthy support. So both of these types of enamel, they're different, but they both have to be removed for different reasons. All right, so our second step is getting primary resistance form. Resistance form is defined as the shape and placement of the preparation walls to enable both the remaining tooth structure and the eventual restoration to withstand masticatory forces and the associated fracture. So this involves a couple things. The floors, here we have our gingival floor and our pulpal floor of this class two restoration the floors should be horizontal in order to best withstand occlusal forces. So flat floors. If the extension of the preparation is more than half 
the distance from primary groove to cusp tip, consider capping the cusp. So we want to preserve cusps and marginal ridges whenever possible to maintain the tooth's strength and integrity. But if we ever need to extend the preparation because there are caries that are compromising that cusp, for example, and we go more than half this distance, we're encroaching onto that cusp, we have to consider capping this tooth with an onlay or even a crown in order to maintain its integrity. Also, we want rounded internal line angles. Here you can see these sharp angles as opposed to the more rounded edges in this one. And sharp line angles act as areas of stress concentration. And so rounded line angles are much more desirable. So here are your aspects of primary resistance form. And then we also, usually in tandem with that, we're thinking about primary retention form. So retention is defined as prevention of displacement of the restorative material. So convergent walls is something that we want. And this occlusal convergence means that the walls of the preparation slightly converge in order to lock the restorative material and prevent it from dislodging occlusally. So as you go up, the two walls kind of lean in towards each other, the two opposite walls all throughout this prep, so that the material, once it's uh, placed and either sets in the case of amalgam or is cured in the case of composite, it has a much harder time escaping because those walls are tipping in towards each other, preventing occlusal displacement. Dovetailing of the preparation, which you see on the right, prevents proximal displacement of the restoration. Similar idea, right? The walls are coming in towards each other, this time from our axial view here. And we can see that as these walls are coming in closer, the material, when it sets or is cured, is going to have a much harder time escaping in this direction. We can rely, however, more on bonding if we're using a composite material, which we'll talk more about later in the series. But these features are absolutely essential if you're using amalgam. And also note how both the 245 and 330 burrs that we talked about in the last video give you both resistance form, because you have these rounded ends of the burr that are naturally causing rounded internal line angles, and also you're getting primary retention form because that pear-shaped occlusal convergence of, is built into the burr itself. So that's pretty cool and a smart design choice for those burrs. Now next we're thinking about convenience form. Convenience is talking about improved access and visibility as needed. So this is extension of the preparation in order to provide adequate visibility, accessibility, and just overall ease of operation in preparing and restoring the tooth so you can see what the heck it is you're doing. All right, so that's enough for the initial tooth preparation. The final prep focuses on removing any remaining defects, pulpally and axially, and incorporating any additional features like liners, slots, and pins, and we'll talk all about that right right now. So you might have been wondering, well, what are we doing about the, the caries that goes deeper into the tooth? Well, this is where we take care of it. So the initial preparation may remove all caries, in which case this step is skipped entirely. But if there are caries remaining, we have to remove all infected dentin. So the elimination of any caries tooth structure or faulty restorative material left in the tooth preparation is happening now, and now we are concerned with the depth. So we've already talked, uh, taking care of the length and the width of the initial prep, but now, if and only if there are caries remaining pulpally or axially, this is the step to extend the prep as needed. So all of this infected dentin needs to go. Now we might get to the point where we're getting very close to the pulp if it is a very large uh, filling, for instance. 
And so pulp protection is the next thing that we consider to protect the pulp or aid pulpal recovery if indicated. So if we're doing some deep excavation and we're getting close to the pulp, we may have to consider an indirect pulp cap with some kind of base material. If we have a pulp exposure, it's less than one millimeter in diameter and it's asymptomatic, we can consider a direct pulp cap with a liner and a base. And if it's a greater than one millimeter exposure, either carious exposure that carries just feeds right into the pulp or it's a mechanical exposure on the, by the operator and it's symptomatic, we have to think about some kind of pulpotomy or root canal treatment. So let's talk some more specifics of the materials used here and these things that are frequently uh, popping up on the board exams. So sealer and desensitizer is kind of a thing you can use in most of the preparations that you do that go into the dentin layer, especially if you're concerned with sensitivity issues down the road. It includes dentinal tubules by cross-linking tubular proteins. So it blocks up and clogs up the tubules that, uh, as we talked about with the hypersensitivity theory, result in th that sensitivity that patients often feel. This is for if you have two millimeters or more of dentin remaining between the depth of the defect and the pulp. Gluma is probably the most commonly used. It's a combination of glutaraldehyde and hema, which is where it gets its name from, and water as well. Liner is used for direct or near pulp exposures. So now we're getting closer to encroaching on that pulpal tissue. It provides a barrier to, prevent, to protect dentin from residual reactants, the restoration and oral fluids. It provides insulation, thermal protection, and also pulpal treatment. It can actually uh, cause the odontoblasts in here to form tertiary reparative dentin. And calcium hydroxide or dical is frequently used as a liner. And then a base can be used for metal restorations and when liner is used. So it goes over the liner in order to protect it from being resorbed and washed out. The base also provides thermal protection and can distribute local stress across all the underlying dentin. Resin modified glass ionomer, which is what this stands for, is frequently used as a base. Vitrobond is our example here. So here's a quick reference chart for what material you're using as your restorative material, how far from the pulp you are, which is the remaining dentin thickness, that's what that means, and what pulp protective materials you might consider using in each of those scenarios. So feel free to take a screenshot of this if you like for future reference while you're studying. So, now we can think about once all the carriers are removed, the pulp is protected if needed, we can think about secondary resistance and retention features. So these include things like retentive grooves. These are little shallow grooves that are placed often with a 169L or a quarter round burr just inside the dentin enamel junction to help prevent displacement of the material proximally in this case it's going to prevent it from moving this way but it can also be placed in areas to prevent occlusal displacement as well it's mostly done for amalgam restorations that don't have that benefit of enamel and dentin bonding we can also use beveled enamel margins as seen here and beveled margins provide more surface area and roughness for enamel bonding with composite. Slots and pins can be used interchangeably and offer similar amounts of retention. Now typically these things are only used for complex amalgam restorations that are either uh, missing cusps and or external walls entirely in order to help bolster their resistance and retention form because again, with amalgam, you cannot rely on bonding. So slots, we see a slot right here in this complex prep 
and it has to be at least one millimeter deep, one millimeter long, and about 0.5 millimeters inside that dentin enamel junction. And pins are can also be used. Self-threading are the most common and usually where a vertical wall is missing. Here is an example of a little pin there that's placed kind of in line where you where you can imagine that cusp tip was at some point before the tooth was prepped. So those are some cool tips and tricks to use for adding additional retention and resistance form in addition to what you've already done in the initial prep stage to just bolster the longevity of that restoration. And finally, we just want to finish external walls, so establish design and smoothness of that cavo surface margin. We also want to clean and inspect the preparation before progressing to the restoration phase. But that's it for the eight steps of the cavity preparation. So definitely commit those eight steps to memory. This is some really good board exam stuff there. So moisture control is something that's being done during the preparation and restoration process. I've already talked about stuff like this in other series, but you can use rubber dam, cotton rolls, dry angle suction, local anesthetic. If it has epinephrine, it can also prevent some bleeding and prevention of sulcular fluid, saliva, and blood from con contaminating where you're working is the idea behind these moisture control measures. So we're gonna finish this video with some specifics concerning preparation design for amalgam, composite, and gold. So we can use for an amalgam preparation any kind of burr that we, we prefer, but the board exam does like to say the carbide burr is preferred because you get these smoother walls. For amalgam, we don't really need or want roughened walls, Smooth walls are preferable. Retention, we get from occlusal convergence mostly, which we talked about. And then you can also add those groove slots or pins for some secondary retention if you like. Resistance for the tooth, we want to maintain a 90 degree cavo surface margin. So what does that mean exactly? That means that this, this tooth surface and this part of the cavo surface margin form a 90 degree angle. So here and here should be 90 degree angles for the best resistance, the least likelihood of fracture of that two surface to, is to maintain that 90 degree cavo surface margin. That's really, really helpful. We also want to maintain cusps and marginal ridges. Those are the parts of the tooth that offer the most strength. We want to remove that unsupported or friable enamel that we talked about before. We want to maintain flat pulpal and gingival floors, rounded internal line angles, and pins can offer secondary resistance as well. So that's just a review of all the things we talked about. Now in terms of the resistance of the amalgam material, we also want that to be 90 degrees. And that, that makes sense because if we have 90 degree angle here, we're naturally going to have a 90 degree angle between this part of the cavo surface margin and the amalgam that will restore that missing two structure. So 90 and 90, easy to remember for the board exam. And we didn't talk about this before, but we want at least one and a half to two millimeters depth of the preparation for adequate restorative thickness of the amalgam, which coincidentally, you'll have this if you're at least 0.2 millimeters inside the DEJ, because the enamel is at least two millimeters thick. Now, if amalgam, if the amalgam material is too thin, it will likely fracture. So that's why you wanna have at least this minimal depth of restorative material. For the composite preparation, the board exam likes to prefer us to use coarse diamonds in order to have rough walls. So remember I said before, we want smooth walls for amalgam. For composite, the rough walls offer more surface area, which gives us better retention when we're bonding. So that's why coarse diamonds can be preferred. The nice thing here is that really all of those philosophies stay true for composite. 
except there's not really a need for those retentive features, those secondary features we talked about, grooves, slots, pins, things like that. Occlusal convergence isn't as needed. It's still a good practice to keep, but it's not as relied upon. And we don't need as much of a uniform depth. So the basic idea here is there's a lot, a little bit more freedom and we can perform what's called a conservative prep design and save more to structure as opposed to a strictly conventional prep design that focuses very strictly on retention and resistance features. And lastly, the gold onlay preparation. I'm not going to go into too much depth here because this gets really convoluted, but the most important things to know for the board exam are what these terms mean. So again, the gold onlay preparation can get very, very complex, but if you can just think of these couple quick, um, these nice, uh, what do you call them? Buzzwords, we'll call them for the board exam, because sometimes these words show up and it's just kind of nice to know what they might mean. So a collar is talking about this beveled shoulder around a capped cusp for in order to offer resistance form, this bracing effect, and a skirt is an even less aggressive kind of mini preparation around a capped cusp with like a feather edge margin. And both of these things provide secondary resistance and retention form for your gold onlay preparation. All right, so that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do here, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to Michael Raja, Reb Boyd, Ria Wadwa, Jonathan Muff, Eric DiMatteo, Alexa Klunder, David Jaden, Isabella Caldas, Ali Benjir, Badir Hafnawi, and all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock things like access to these video slides so you can take notes on them while you're studying and practice questions with ex explained answers and all that for board exam prep. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.